Part 1. White Clouds. Horsebow Moon. Rumors of a Reaper. So if you pull up the map, the first thing you'll notice is that HOLY SHIT THE DEATH KNIGHT IS RIGHT THERE! Am I the only one concerned that the man who can one-shot your whole class just appears 10 feet away from you? The first thing you'll notice is that the map branches off into two different paths, with much greater variety between the two compared to the previous chapters. And for the first time this game, there are two possible win conditions, with a turn limit slapped on top of it. You can either kill every last one of or kill every last death knight. Killing the death knight would just have the players snowball down one of the paths. But the first objective is a lot easier, a sort of fallback if you can't kill the death knight. And there are chests strewn about, so you are incentivized to explore both of the unique paths. Let's start with the left side. This path is designed as little battle arenas connected to each other. Each section is wide enough to where decent sized skirmishes can happen, while also giving every unit enough space to contribute to the battle. But the areas are also compact enough to where you can reasonably set up defensive formations and not have to worry about the defensive units with their lower movement slowing down the pace of the group. This area is one of the few places I would actually recommend some of the students promoting to the Armored Knight class, which you should have access to at this point. I do kind of wish these areas were a little more compact so there was a bigger scramble for space that required some planning and foresight to get the optimal use of your units, but it's still pretty solid. You continue through each room and the amount of enemies slowly decreases until you're eventually hitting the middle area where you just pick off two enemies at a time. I get that the rooms add slightly more challenging gimmicks, going from nothing to avoid tiles to being pincered by ranged enemies. But reducing the enemy count keeps the difficulty about the same between each room, sometimes lowering it honestly. I would have much preferred if they had just expanded on the ideas, increasing the difficulty each time. The left side is still a fun path, it just needed to escalate the ideas a little bit better to keep the fun for the whole time. Alright, on to the right side. This first section has a strong resemblance to chapter 12 of Binding Blade. Both contain long, winding hallways, used to slow down the player from their time-based objectives, while also bombarding them with range units. They both promote the use of mounted units to quickly move through the halls, and archers to play the range game, both of which should be freshly acquired in treehouses. The resemblance is uncanny, and this comparison was even the inspiration for this whole series. But Binding Blade wears it better, while the treehouses version fumbles in a couple major areas. The key problem being too much advantage is given to the player rather than the enemy. Binding Blade has you surrounded on both sides by several physical and magical units. Most of your units don't have good defense and res, so tanking hits becomes a lot harder. If your units are too strong, they may end up battling too many enemies during the enemy phase. Treehouses has two archers. Now, the amount of player units is scaled down from Binding Blade. The right half of the map is designed for a small hit squad to quickly blitz through the long halls. And this isn't the major obstacle of the chapter like it is in Binding Blade. I get that. But it's still only two archers. And the first hallway is placed outside of the second archer's range, so now you just get to pick them off one at a time. In Binding Blade, you have to fight them at two range. They are trapped forever inside these walls, so you can't abuse an archer's lack of one range. The only weapon that can outrange them is the unreliable longbow, and spending one turn trying to safely kill one guy with a longbow is way, 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 way too slow. In three houses though, pfft, you gotta be kidding me! They are sitting on the path that you have to go through. Just use the stride gambit with your mounted units and run them down! Archers can't do shit about it! Your archers get a range of 4 with their combat arts, outranging all 2 of the goons. This does let you experience the benefits of certain classes, but the answer feels laid out for you, like it's a solved problem and you're just going through the motions. They need to change the layout so that the enemy could make better use of the game's mechanics. Like I said though, this section isn't the major focus of the map like it is in Binding Blade, so it's a little understandable that it's not as fleshed out. But that's my fucking problem! It's the same problem that I've been having. The dumb structure in chapter 1, the bridge in chapter 2, the fog in chapter 3. All these unique structures and mechanics are introduced and then immediately thrown away without expanding on the concepts. Chapter 23 of Path of Radiance is memorable because it has this giant bridge. And that's it. That's the whole level. But it takes the concept and goes in with a bunch of different obstacles. And then it goes away. It's the only time you see something like that in the whole game, which makes the experience you had with it memorable and unique. 
Even Fates, which had some poorly designed gimmick levels, made those gimmicks the theme for the whole level. With this game though, the gimmicks are here, then gone to Flash, and on to the next one. Speaking of, the next section on the right path is pretty uninteresting, kind of just a time waster to get the treasure chest and the switch that stopped the special tile for the boss. But it really doesn't matter too much because the turn limit is still way too long. If you've played this map once, the mystery of knowing where the teleporters lead goes away. There's not enough enemies to reasonably slow down the collecting process, you're just kind of fetch questing the items. They could easily fix this by randomizing the teleporters, or having a little challenge room with an exceptional treasure guarded by a plethora of enemies. Makes you question how much time you have left to see if it's worth trying, and knowing what's on the other side doesn't make it any easier to get through. The last thing I want to talk about is how the challenges are front loaded. We've seen it before, chapters 2 and 3, maddening mode for chapter 4 with the death knight moving, and now with both paths of this chapter. The most difficult, or most interesting, parts of the map are placed at the start, which lets you reset as often as you like to find the best route possible. Which is exactly what I did when I was fighting the death knight in chapter 4, and it made the fight kind of a joke. It's like having an infinite amount of divine pulses. It just becomes when you beat the challenge, not if you beat it. To that same end though, the end of this chapter is really fun. If you're trying to kill the death knight. It's really scary how much time it takes to get there, and the thought of having to redo all that work if I didn't kill him in one shot, it had me all nervous. Planning out how to get the most people attacking him when I busted down the door, doing damage calcs without being able to see the battle forecast, making sure to conserve my divine pulses, it ended up being a lot of fun. Until I realized how much damage Lysithia does. But not every house is going to have their own Lysithia, so it'll be a lot funner on a different route. This chapter is designed for you to test out newly acquired intermediate classes, with two paths that offer two unique types of challenges. Enemy placement has its highs and its lows, and the ideas are interesting. The problem is that they either fail to evolve the idea, to be more difficult and engaging than the last, or they fail to properly adapt the setup to the new mechanics of the game. Not a complete failure, but does have some problems. The start is strong, but strong starts have trouble being engaging due to soft resetting, especially when what follows can't hold your attention as well. But the ending is fun, and I did have fun for most of the map, I was just feeling a little empty, wanting more, you know? So in the end, I'm gonna rate this map a 6 out of 10.